This is The Big Jump, a podcast about human reinvention, featuring pro athletes who have leveraged their athletic minds for success beyond sports. I'm your host, David Gardner, a professional basketball player turned CEO of branding firm Color Jar. Oh yeah, I'm your host, David Gardner, and in each episode of The Big Jump, I sit down with a pro athlete who has created success beyond sports, and today's guest is a true icon. Soccer Hall of Famer Julie Foudy, who made her big jump from soccer champion to a champion of women's empowerment. Julie's work to empower and inspire women began with her play on the field as the co-captain of the legendary 1999 World Cup winning team, widely regarded as one of the greatest sports teams of all time. You'll hear Julie's inside story on why and how their team was able to capture the hearts and minds of America and ultimately transcend sport leaving an indelible mark on culture that kickstarted a worldwide boom in the popularity of soccer and women's team sports. You know, you didn't have anyone at the Federation going, waking up thinking, how am I going to advance women's soccer today? No. So we constantly had to kind of push and rattle. As a tomboy kid, Julie was nicknamed Jimmy, and she opens up about how she struggled to be seen as both athletic and feminine in her awkward high school years and what she did to deal with it. You'll hear about her double life in college, simultaneously playing for both Stanford as a four-time All-American and also for the U.S. women's national soccer team as co-captain, winning the first-ever Women's World Cup while cramming for her college finals. Julie has the number four all-time world ranking for most games played in international competition, where she won two World Cups, two Olympic golds, as well as a white gold, Julie's name for a silver medal. Her career on the field was capped off with an induction into the Soccer Hall of Fame alongside her teammate, Mia Hamm. You'll hear about Mia's shy demeanor and how it was a complimentary leadership style to Julie's vocal leadership, a trait that earned her the nickname Loudy Foudy. That trait has served Julie off the field as well, as she's built an impressive resume of empowering, inspiring others. Julie received the FIFA Fair Play Award for her efforts against child labor, the first American and first woman to win the honor and she served as the president of the Women's Sports Foundation, among other impressive roles. In 2006, she and her husband founded the Julie Foudy Sports Leadership Academy, an organization focused on sports and leadership instead of only sports. Shoot me now if I have to do this for the rest of my life. (laughs) Like, we should not be just teaching a kid how to kick a soccer ball. The value of sports, I always felt, was all the other things you learn, right? Also an effort to empower and inspire women and girls to lead, Julie is the author of the book, Choose to Matter. I loved listening to it on Audible, and if you're new to Audible, you can hear it or one of the other 180,000 titles for free by going to thebigjumpshow.com slash audiobook. Julie is also the narrator and producer of the incredible ESPN 9 for 9 film, The 99ers, based around her own home video footage of the incredible 1999 team. And in this episode, you'll hear the story of how the documentary came to be. And last but not least, Julie is also an accomplished sports broadcaster and is the primary color commentator for women's soccer on ESPN, among other networks. Julie is a force, and I cannot wait for you to feel her energy and hear her incredible stories on this episode. And if you're new to The Big Jump, don't forget to subscribe and rate five stars if you like what you hear. But first, a quick thank you to our sponsor, Grand Voyage, a luxury fashion brand and a personal favorite of mine that makes shoes and bags designed in L.A. and handcrafted in Italy at the same factories as the other premier fashion labels, but at a much better value. Get the crazy discount of $35 off your purchase at Grand Voyage, only available to listeners of The Big Jump. Just go to thebigjumpshow.com slash shoes, and from there, as they say, the rest is up to you. And with that, I give you my inspiring conversation with the iconic dynamo, Julie Foudy. Julie Foudy. Woohoo! Yeah. What's up, David? Thanks for being on the big jump. Thanks for traveling south. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for welcoming into your home. It's good to be back in sunny Southern California. You know, I'm really excited to get into your big jump. So kind of how you went from soccer champion to women's leadership champion. First, where I want to start is way, way back. And that's what's your earliest memory playing sports? Mm, Way, way back, huh? Well, I am the youngest of four. 
We call ourselves the Rowdy Fowdies to give you a little indication of how this household was. We literally had two older brothers and an older sister. And in our old house, we would have pictures hung at like the baseboards at the bottom. And people would be like, why is that picture down there? Oh, because someone's head went through that wall. (laughs) (laughs) So we're covering up the drywall hole. (laughs) Like literally my mom would move a picture down below rather than fix it. So it, it was an active household, very athletic, except for soccer was kind of just launching in Southern California in, you know, I was born in uh, 1971 and I was begging my mom at five, can I play? And back then she was like, no, no, there's no organized soccer yet. And then at six, mom, I want to play at seven. Finally, there was an AYSO team that popped up. So I was really like one of the first to play. I think AYSO literally started like the year I started playing and and when I was seven years old in the late 70s. And and then I quickly got on a club team. I played for this this really good soccer team called the Soccerettes, true story, real name, Go Gray Machine. (laughs) I love them. And and I played literally for my entire career with the Soccerettes. My parents were very laissez-faire type of parents. And again, maybe it's a consequence of being the fourth and they're like, we're over organized sports, but (laughs) they never came to games. And if my parents would show up to a game, it was like, what are your parents doing here? I'm like, I don't know. Hi, mom, dad, what are you doing? (laughs) And the consequence of that is I love to play. I was out there because I wanted to be out there. And when they came, it was great, but I didn't need them on the sidelines to justify you know, my play and how I was doing or to, you know, push me even more. It was always self-driven. So I, I say to my husband all the time, because there's, there is this pressure as parents nowadays, like, why aren't you at their game? Mm -hmm. And and at first my husband would be like, you're missing another game. You're away. And I'm like, yeah, it's okay. It's going to be okay. They're going to be fine. And it's actually healthy that we're not at every game. Like sometimes you have to back off a little bit. And that's where I think they gave me this great perspective. They let me do it for me, not for them, which I I always am super grateful for. Where do you think that drive was coming from and that persistence? And what about sport made you want to play so badly? I was a little hyperactive kind of ADD kid that was very social and wanted to run around. So soccer fit all those things, team sports. I could be social. I could be active. And I literally just played with the boys. I was such a tomboy. I played with the boys at recess when I was in elementary school. They'd like come get me with their little rubber bouncing ball. And I was like the only chick out there. And yeah, so, uh, and I don't know if that's a consequence of like my older brothers, but I was very much a tomboy. Like I played sports and you know, I was in OPs with no shirt. I mean, we have pictures. My, my brother's friends call me Jimmy, <laughs> literally, because I would be without a top when I was younger. I mean, it wouldn't make a difference anyways now. You couldn't tell <laughs> Uh, that was, you know, that was, I, I, I had short hair. I look like a little boy. So I was all sports all the time. Jimmy, huh? Jimmy. Yeah. And so yeah. how was that for you getting called Jimmy as a young girl? There's this classic photo of me, like in little corduroy OP shorts, which were like all the rage with no top on when I was like, you know, 21, no, <laughs> <laughs> seven. And no top. Like I just went around like that's how it was. I rolled that way. So I, I didn't know the difference. I just, this is who I was. And you know, what's amazing is my parents always were really supportive about whatever I wanted to play. It wasn't ever, oh no, girl, girls don't play tackle football, honey. You know, that's very unladylike. It was like, yeah, just be home by dinner. And maybe that's a consequence of being the fourth is they kind of lose track of you a bit. But <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'd be out until dark playing, you know, on the streets with, with the boys and, and getting dirty. And, and, uh, and my parents were great about that. How much of the Jimmy nickname do you think was perhaps the way you looked, as you mentioned, or the way you behaved and how much of it was a product of the times and, you know, fewer references of excellent female athletes and yeah. perhaps a little lesser participation rate? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure a bit of both, right? Because you just, you didn't find as many girls that were and the weird thing is, is that it's, I never even thought twice about it, right? And in, in a good way, it wasn't like, oh, I don't see any girls out here. I did, I didn't care, you know. Like I say to my eleven-year-old daughter when she wasn't, she's just now in middle school, but in elementary school, I'd say, you know, what are you doing at recess? Well, I want to play soccer, but there's no girls out there. So what? Go play. 
But it's so hard, right? Because she has this like, wait, no, why aren't there any girls out there? And I see that there's a gender difference here. And and then she eventually did get out there and she brings other girls with her and more girls jump in. But I, I don't know, in, in elementary school, I remember just being kind of gender blind that way in a really healthy way. Yeah, they can kind of go either way for a youngest child or, you know, maybe you're wired to kind of fight for attention being the youngest of four right. or you wire yourself to be super independent and self-satisfied in, right. in your pursuit. Yeah. In those younger years, you know, you describe some awkwardness that I think all of us really have as, mm. I mean, I'm a six foot nine, you know, 35 year old man, but man, I was a, a very tall and very skinny teen. So we all had like our awkward years. Was sports an escape for you? Was soccer an escape for you? I don't know if I was escaping, but I do remember high school just being brutal in that regard and not in, in a necessarily a negative way, but like, you know, and, and maybe I didn't quite process it, but I look back and go, oh my God, like, you know, I, it was terrifying for me to be thought of as when I got to high school, you know, coming from being called Jimmy as a kid and I didn't care. But when you get to high school, you're like, wait, no, you know, I, I'd be done with soccer practice and I'd be in the grocery store and, um, you know, so an old you know person would come up to me, young, young man, do you know what time it is? And I'd be like, because mm. <laughs> I had short hair and I just got done with soccer and I was mortified by that. So I'd wear these huge earrings and uh, pearl necklaces or, you know, anything. I, I wouldn't call myself super feminine, but that to me was like, no. So I think it was, um, it was something that gave me great confidence for sure. But mm -hmm. I don't know if it was like, I have to have soccer to have it as an escape, but like, I just, I'm at always love to play. And so and now, you know, again, being on a team has always been such a huge part of me, having this built-in set of teammates and sisters, really. And so I was really lucky throughout the course of my career to just get on amazing teams, whether it's a high school team or the soccerettes for 10 years, or call, my college team is still very close. So these teams I've been on have always defined my group. And my foundation, which I feel really lucky about, which is why, you know, and, and beyond sports, it's just that they, they shape who you are when you're surrounded by amazing women all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm always advocating for girls to, to get involved and get on a team. And I don't care what team it is and I don't care what sport it is, but be part of something that's, you know, that helps you realize the importance of working with other people and dealing with setbacks and adversity and all these things you deal with as a group together. In addition to that support you felt, you know, in real time, day to day with your team, did you have a hero or someone that you really looked up to as a, as a kid? You know, I get that question a lot and not really. That's the crazy thing. Like there was no women's soccer team. You didn't see much soccer. And so if anything, it would have been like, a, you know, a Magic Johnson or a Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I was a big Lakers fan or someone with the Los Angeles Rams or Steve Sachs with the Dodgers. These were all local teams that we, you know, followed with my family, but it was always men. And it was always guys that, you know, look like you, David, six mm -hmm. foot nine, and not someone I could really relate to. Like, oh yeah, I'm going to be doing what David does. I'm going to be dunking basketballs. No, I was five foot five, you know, five, six on a good day. So I did, I didn't have like a female role model that I grew up watching or saying, ah, that's going to be me one day. And that, that is, I think, why we considered our role to be so powerful. And we took it so seriously as role models and, and knew the importance of that for a young girl, mm -hmm. having not had that. You know, so, so you're talking about how there's a lack of female role models in sport, though I was struck by what was happening more broadly in the U.S. with regards to women's rights as you came of age. So, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the decade before yours, you know, starting in the 60s, you know, things kicking off with the Equal Pay Act in 1963, mm -hmm. and that really being a, a first domino to fall that led to other things that really were, you know, benefiting in the advancement of, of women. And, you know, you mentioned you're born in 1971, 1972, Title, Title IX, yep. you know, very fortuitous timing, perhaps for, you know, that to gain some momentum than before you came of age. And then the 80s, really your teens and your, your childhood, mm -hmm. just an absolute string of advancements for women, a lot of firsts, 
1981, Sandra Day O'Connor, you know, first yeah. Supreme Court justice. 1983, Sally Ride, first female in space. 84, Geraldine Ferraro, first female on a vice presidential ticket. And then the rest of the 80s, just like this string of legislative advances kind of culminating in 1992, which they called the year of the woman. Right. That was the year you graduated college. <laughs> How do you think that yeah. shaped you? Um, yeah, the... The amazing thing is, is I didn't even know what Title IX was till after college. And it took, there was a, a delayed effect with Title IX, of course. Like you had this incredible legislation passed, which was started as an educational amendment, right? Because girls weren't being admitted into colleges at the same rate as men. And uh, Senator Birchby's wife, who he says was the smartest in the family, she couldn't get into law school and had better test scores and grades than he did. And he is at the same time trying to get into law schools and getting accepted into everyone. And he's like, this isn't right. Right. And so he's kind of the grandfather of, um, with Patsy Mink of title nine. And, and the byproduct was there in fine print, there was a sports component to it as well, but it didn't kick in. You know, I, I went to Stanford when I, when I, so I was on the national team in the late eighties, I was already playing for the U.S. So when I was graduating from college, I was a starter on the national team. So in today's age, right, a starter on the U.S. national team who's 18 years old coming out of high school with great grades could probably get 300 full rides, right? Right. 300 different Division I universities to have money to offer. There was maybe five that had wow. scholarships. And this is 1989. So this is 17 years post the passage of Title IX in the school I had always wanted to go to. I happen to be wearing a shirt today. Yep. Uh, go card was Stanford University. I had grown up with a teacher who talked about it all the time. I had written in my fourth grade journal that I was going to get a scholarship on soccer to go to Stanford, but Stanford didn't have any soccer scholarships. My parents had to sell off the kids in the house to afford <laughs> Stanford. And I was told, oh, we'll get one next year. We'll get one my sophomore year. Oh, we're going to get one junior year. My senior year, I got the first ever women's soccer scholarship. So, wow. Yeah. But for three years, I went paying, thinking it's coming. I know it's coming. But I didn't know what Title IX was. Had I known what Title IX was, I would have been like, you, what's going on here? Like, let's go get me, you know, let's move this scholarship forward a little bit. And then, of course, right after that, they got five and then they got 10. But it took 20 years for Title IX to take effect. So as things are starting to change, it's still, I mean, and I'm still amazed at how slowly cultural shifts happen, mm -hmm. you know, and that we're still fighting for some of these things. And yes, things are much better and women's sports is in a much better place, but there's some stuff that still is really slow. So um, that was always an interesting one for me that it took, you know, 20 years before some of these universities actually started offering scholarships to, to girls in different sports. I didn't realize it had that big of a lag. Mm. Um, and it's interesting also that you know, Title IX now, I think most people only think of sports. Right. Um, exactly. And that's the association with it. But at the beginning, it was really, I mean, what was passed, it had to do with, um, and, and you're the expert on this, but, you know, prohibiting discrimination in all aspects of education. Right. And, and so you're was, saying it was like including sports. Yeah. And, and Senator Birch Bay said, had we not, put that in like fine print. And it was, he goes, it was in a smaller font. We kind of snuck it in, right? He says, there's no way if they knew what it would do, they would have not said okay to it. So he says, when we put it in and he says, but it literally has transformed the sports landscape for girls in this country to the point where you get people all the time coming up to me from Brazil, from South America, from Europe. How can we get, Title IX passed from Australia? How can we get Title IX, Title IX like legislation passed in our country? Because we know what it's done for you. Mm -hmm. What was it like? So you're a four time All American at Stanford and also played on the national team, including at the first ever Women's World Cup in 1991. What was that like for you, like playing for both your university and for the US team? You know, it was. It was Back then, you didn't have to travel as much. So it wasn't like, 
I mean, we still were traveling, but nowadays, you know, they go into residency for like six months before an event and you kind of go into lockdown. So you really couldn't do both. Back then you could do both. So I'd be gone for two weeks in China and I'd come back and, you know, a TA, a teacher assistant would be like, okay, let's sit down for, you know, an evening and I'll catch you up to speed or for two days and I'll catch you up to speed on everything you miss. And, and, you know, it's not like you had email too. We weren't on computers. Mm -hmm. So back, it sounds like the dark ages. It was challenging, but it also, um, it also was doable. I don't think you could do it nowadays. Did your classmates have an appreciation for what you were doing? I don't, I don't know if they even really, I mean, they'd be like, you're gone again, but I don't, I don't, no one knew kind of what the national team was back then. I mean, we literally went to China for the World Cup in 91 and it happened to fall during finals or actually I came back and we were starting finals. So I literally spent the entire World Cup studying my brains out, trying to get back ready for finals. But there was no like, oh, that's fabulous. It, it was almost <laughs> like, great. And we won it. Right. And we thought this was going to transform sport, you know, women's soccer in America. And <laughs> there was no ticker tape parade. My professors were like, where the hell have you been? <laughs> Sit down. You have two hours, right? Knock when you're done. Here's the exam. <laughs> you know, uh, so it, it, it was just a different time. Sounds like a bit of a double life. Yeah, it was. It, it, it definitely was because there wasn't a, there wasn't a, an awareness about what you were doing or I mean, appreciation. Yeah, but like an awareness that would say, oh, OK, maybe we should restructure this a little bit. No, it was like, well, go. It's time. It's finals. <laughs> so you mentioned that cultural change happens more slowly than you'd often like it to. Yeah. Um, so looking at the early 60s into the 70s and 80s and all the advancement uh, for women, women's rights, in a sense, when the national team came to be in, in the 90s, where you kind of had the one you thought was going to catch hold, but then fast forwarding to 1999, the one that really did catch hold mm -hmm. with, with culture, uh, in a sense, America was culturally primed for this women's team to arrive. Almost I see it as perhaps a symbol of the decades before it. What do you think it was though about your team that really caught the imagination and hearts of America? Well, one, it was kind of a collision of things it, is that, you know, for years we had been saying, you know, you're not marketing us. And we've got this gold mine of personalities and talent and we're the best in the world. And why, why aren't you marketing us? Like you're, you're not tapping into this untapped market. And regardless of how you feel about women's soccer, there is this market out there, but no one knows we exist. We are living in a vacuum. So please do something, spend a little money, invest a little bit. You'll have a big return. And they look at us like we were crazy. They being U.S. soccer, who was the federation who oversees all of US, USA soccer. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a conscious bias. It was more an unconscious bias because it was men who grew up following men's soccer. And so this woman's game was kind of like nah, an afterthought. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you didn't have anyone at the federation going, waking up thinking, how am I going to advance women's soccer today? No. So we constantly had to kind of push and rattle and... And this is something as we were feisty teenagers when we started on the national team that we realized pretty quickly, like, you know, why, why do we get to a city and every time we're going out to dinner after a game, you know, the restaurant's like, what, what are you guys doing in town? Like the, the servers, the people in the restaurant. And we were like, oh, we had a game. What? I didn't know about that game. And so there's an interest, but no one ever knew. And so one of the things we realized with the 99 World Cup is if we're going to do this and we're going to do it big in big stadiums, like there has to be a lead in of marketing and grassroots efforts. And so thankfully, U.S. soccer by then, by the 90s, figured out, OK, if we put together a whole local organizing committee and uh, a group that for three, four years is, you know, knocking on doors of clubs and leagues and grassroots programs, there's so many kids that play in this country, you can create something. So for three years leading into the 99 World Cup, they did just that. And that's really the first women's event, in my recollection, that's done that, where there's a concerted marketing effort of, we're going to blow this up. We're going to have you guys go out and do clinics. 
We're going to do media. We're going to get celebrities. We're going to do all these things in all these different markets around the country. And we're going to put it in big stadiums. And people thought we were crazy. Like, why are you playing at Giant Stadium? Why are you at the Rose Bowl? Why are you at Soldier Field? There's no way you're going to, you know, sell 80,000 tickets. And we'd be like, well, it's a World Cup. This is how it should be. And yes, we think we will, but we had no idea. (laughs) We were starting to panic. Like, what if we go to these stadiums and they're empty? That's kind of embarrassing, actually. So we didn't know, but we just kept busting for, you know, a year, for two years of anytime you know, they wanted us to do a clinic. We would do a clinic. You want to sign autographs? We'll sign autographs. You want us knocking on people's doors? We will knock on people's doors. I don't care what it takes. We will do it. We were that committed to selling it. And um, so literally driving into MetLife, it, then I think it was Giant Stadium. We were on the New Jersey Turnpike. It's our first game of the World Cup. And we know that, yeah, there's been some momentum and they've sold tickets, but we don't have any idea how well it's gone. And literally... Um, we're told as we're driving in that it's a sellout. And we were like, oh, thank God, we're not going to have an empty stadium. And then it just snowballed from there. But it's the power of, and the thing that's still so slow, especially globally in women's sports, with just a little bit of investment, your return on investment can be very large. And it was a huge success. And it was a great example of, this is the standard and this is how it should be. And that's the thing I think we were most proud of. I saw that the head of the Women's World Cup that year had a very public stated mission to set the example and set the standard of what a women's sporting event should be mm-hmm. and can be in order to inspire a generation. That's a lot of added pressure, I would imagine, for you on top of trying to win a competition and play this role on the field is to achieve this broader mission, not just for soccer, but for women's sport and for young girls and women everywhere. What was that added layer like? And how did you balance that, what I would imagine to be pressure, in addition to doing kind of your role and your job and performing on the field? Yeah. So Billie Jean King became a friend in uh, like the mid 90s and helped us with a ton of different things off off the field with the team contract wise and gave us her perspective on what they did with tennis. And here's what you should be thinking about. And uh, here, you know, if you had a blank canvas, what would you want to build for the next generation? But separately for when the world cup for 99 was about to start at one point, I think I said to her, Billy, it's King. I call her Kinger actually Kinger. It's, it's a lot of pressure, right? Like if we don't do well in this tournament, it's not going to be a success. Like if we, if we stink it up and, you know, the early rounds or the quarterfinals, we go out in the quarters, like we're going to have empty stadiums. And, and that's a lot of pressure. And she looked at me like cross-eyed. <laughs> she never <laughs> heard going, Bowdy, come on. Pressure is a privilege. And I was like, you're right. You're right. She's like, do you know how many people would love to be in the situation you're in? You go hug it. You go embrace it. Go tell your team. This is a privilege. You have fought for this. You're ready. So that became kind of our mantra, uh, which is her mantra for many years. Pressure is a privilege. Amazing. Yeah. And um, and I think actually because we had such a group of characters in terms of personalities and we just, we love to have fun. We'd be pulling pranks all the time. We'd be doing uh, prank videos on teammates that, and we had a coach that realize the importance of that joy within the group and allowing it, you know, we can mess around literally the, the night before our opening game, we pulled this huge prank on Brandy because she had posed naked on the cover of magazine. And we, so we did this whole video in, in, and had all these players posing naked in these poses, but like covering our privates with like crosswords. Cause she loved crosswords or like <laughs> shin guards on our breasts or, you know, and then we'd, do these, you know, Austin Powers had just come out. We do these Austin Power vignettes using like all our, you know, staff as like doing these crazy dances in between. We we shot the whole thing and cut it together the night before a game. And our coach allows us to play this prank on Brandy. We tell her like, oh, there's this big uh, ABC News special they're running on our team. Everyone gather in front of the TV. And we have we get everyone from the TV and we roll the video of all of these naked, you know, images of the same pose that Brandy had doing, had been doing. And it was hysterical. But that's like how that team was. So I think that I'll actually helped keep the pressure in perspective as well, right? Because 
we love to have fun. But then when it was game time, it was like, all right, let's go. That makes a lot of sense that that would help both alleviate a bit of pressure, but and also bond the team together. And, you know, obviously it was a winning team and winning teams are easier to cheer for. But there was that added layer of kind of magic, like an aura mm. around that team. And it's my opinion that what you were just describing with the amount of fun you had contributed to that yeah. aura. Yeah. You know, in I'm in the branding and design business. And what we always look for is how to make essence align with expression. And what I mean by that is like, is truly what's on the inside being displayed for the world to see in a way that's genuine and authentic. Yeah. And you had you and yeah, your teammates yeah. had that. You had this right. sort of all American fun and that you actually loved each other and you were mm -hmm. actually enjoying this. And whether it was overt or sort of between the lines, I think people could feel that. I yeah. remember as a, you know, a high school student, I could feel that. Yeah. And that that was one of the other things that I was going to say is the factors of colliding, right? With the the marketing. And then you had this really marketable group of women that people could relate to. It wasn't, you know, a a person driving a Lamborghini and get, or getting out of a Range Rover. It was, you know, the chick down the street from you. And that's what we reminded them of. It was, oh, I can relate. These are, you know, women who are just doing something they love and, and they're not being paid millions, but gosh, they're really good at what they, they're doing. And then of course we were winning, right? You need, yeah. you needed that component. People were like, no, it's cause you know, many of you are hot or I'm <laughs> like, uh, yeah, it wouldn't matter if we were hot and losing because we'd be losing and that would be <laughs> something that's not covered. So yeah, the fact that we were winning and, and we were good and, and marketable. And it really was just an, a neat group of women who authentically liked each other, right? People were always like, did you really get along that well? I'm like, yeah, actually we did. We, we used to sit in rooms together laughing and right before the final we were together and one of our, um, we always had an extra room that was a suite that had all the food and the snacks and the board games. And it was kind of our congregation spot. And we were sitting together and, and laughing and thinking, oh, it's almost over. What are we going to, you know, what are we going to do when we can't just hang out and get paid to do the thing we love together? <laughs> That's a bummer. Why does this have to end? So I got a sense of how much fun you were having uh, amidst all the kind of pressure and kind of the pinnacle of attention that you'd reached uh, from the world around you in your uh, the documentary that you produced, the ESPN Nine for Nine, uh, titled "The 99ers, which was excellent. I really enjoyed and would recommend for people to see. And so that was built really around your home video footage of that team. So this is in a pre-social media world. The amount of sharing and recording and documenting, right? Documenting. Yeah, that word? that's a word. I think it that's is a now. great word. <laughs> we'll add it. it. It was not at the height, of course, that it is today. So what right. prompted you to pick up a home video camera right. and appoint yourself, you know, chief documentarian of this experience? Well, no, no one, to your point, no one had, you know, cell phones back then where you could record stuff. And so my friend who is an editor and a producer had like a high eight camera and back then that was, you know, probably the best type of camera, but it was still like a small little home video camera. And she said, is anyone documenting any of this? And I said, no. And she's like, hey, take my camera and start shooting film with stuff. And maybe one day, you know, we'll put it together into, you know, a really cool film about what you guys did. And this is months before 99. So I always had this camera on me. I was shooting all the time. I mean, we just have reams and reams of all this videotape. And that's how it started. And I literally, we forgot about it until ESPN 30 for 30, the film group came up and said, Hey, we, we want to do something on the world cup, but we feel like it's already been done with HBO's dare to dream, which they did a very good documentary on it as well. And we were talking about doing it on a league and all these other things. And then like 45 minutes into the meeting, I was like, wait, I have all this footage. And she's like, what? I was like, Aaron Leiden, who's the, the producer, she's, uh, who directed it. I said, I have all this footage, like hours and days and days of footage that we've never done anything with. But Tracy and I come as a team. Like we do this together. She's going to edit the piece. And she's like, well, send me like a short clip of it. So we sent her off. Tracy had years earlier cut like a little three minute 
piece using the footage. And literally within five minutes, they're like, we're done. We're doing it. Green light, go. And that was the start of it. And we almost forgot we had it. Where you have, you know, the president of the United States attending your game and dropping in the locker room afterwards. Right. Twice. Twice. <laughs> Drop right. by twice. And DC first lady and the Hillary. LA game. Yeah. What appealed to you about shooting so much behind the scenes? I, I don't, I think just cause it's, again, there was just so much fun. Right. And, uh, and when it's not like a really formal camera crew tagging along with you, it's just a teammate with a camera. It's like, you know, half the stuff we couldn't even use because it was probably not appropriate, but it was fun. It was a lot of dancing. It was, you know, Mia, who people knew was very shy and reserved her personality, which is hysterical. She's one of the funniest human beings I know. And she's just silly and singing and dancing. And so you get a totally different perspective that, you know, if you're rolling with a full on documentary camera uh, crew that you're never going to get, right? Because the team's not going to show you that. So that's what I loved about it is it was, you know, it was raw. It was up close and personal on who this team really was. It was an interesting contrast between you and Mia Hamm. You know, your nickname's Loudy Foudy mm -hmm. and you've got the camera and, you know, it seemed like you liked hamming it up mm -hmm. and everything else uh, behind the scenes and interviewing your teammates and being silly and all this. And then you have the face of the team who probably wanted the spotlight the least. It was an interesting pairing between the two of you. Yeah. But that's what made our team so special. It's like, imagine if you had a superstar who only wanted attention, right? And it was about her. And for Mia, I mean, that what that shyness was really genuine. It wasn't, it wasn't, oh, I'm just going to play shy in front of the cameras. Like she did not want the attention. She did not want to do photo shoots. She didn't want to stay, but she realized that she was the face and the poster child of this team. And so she did it. And, and, um, and she carried that mantle, even though she wasn't very comfortable with it. And that's the thing that made our team so special is she was the least selfish player on the team. And she was our superstar. It was never about her. She'd thank, you know, her teammates and her staff and her massage therapist and the postman and the parking lot attendant and, <laughs> I mean, she'd go through when she'd accept an award and I'd be like, hey, how about accepting the fact that, you know, you put some hard work in and you you deserve this award and you should take some credit. And she's like, no, it wasn't me. It's all you guys. I mean, that's how she was. So she set this wonderful foundation for what this team was. And it was always the we is greater than the me. And that comes from our superstar, Mia, having that mentality. And I you know, and I am forever grateful. I still, to this day, I say, you know, our team would have been so different if our superstar was this ass wipe, I always say. <laughs> she says, ass weepe. Ass weepe, to put it delicately. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, imagine if you were an ass wipe. <laughs> that would have been weird. <laughs> so the second gold uh, in 99 uh, in the World Cup and, you know, all in two Olympic golds as well. You did a 10-day farewell tour with Mia Hamm, Joy Fawcett, Brandy Chastain. And that was kind of marked, some call that the end of the golden era of, of women's soccer. And there's been much more success, you know, to come after that, but it was certainly the end of an era. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you the next day waking up with all of that behind you for the first time? Hmm. I don't know if I've ever been asked that. That's a good question, David. You should do this for a living. <laughs> You know, honestly, by then I had been playing on the national team for like almost two decades because I started so young and traveling and, and gosh, what, you know, a gift it was and a blessing for as long as I did it. And like I was saying, we just had so much fun doing it together, but I was ready <laughs> for next phase. Right. So everyone talks about that transition is different for every athlete, but I remember being like, yes. You're ready. I'm ready. Like, I don't want to wake up and have to worry about, you know, where am I going to train today? And, you know, what am I doing? And, and I was 33 and ready to have kids. And uh, I wasn't going to pull a Joy Fawcett where she, you know, crank out three kids while she's playing. Amazing. And then, you know, be back training two weeks later. So um, I was ready for that next phase. And, and so I, I you know, I, the transition was really easy for me. Hmm. Yeah. Because I mentally was ready. How did you go about getting mentally ready, getting to that point? 
you know, I had always had a ton of other interests while I was playing, right? I was already doing television. I loved politics. I was always interested in other things. So I always, you know, and I, I think it probably took away a bit from my playing, which I will readily admit. But I also knew like, if I'm just 100% soccer, I'm not going to be happy and I'm not going to be playing well because I'm not happy. So even though maybe, you know, I didn't study enough film as I should have, or, you know, do a, more self-analysis of my playing or watch more soccer, I was like, shoot me now. Cause I, you know, I don't want to do that. I have all these other interests in life. So I knew while I was playing that I needed to kind of foster that in those other interests. So that's why I think the transition was pretty easy because I had already been kind of dabbling in stuff. And I knew I probably was going to go into television, even though I originally thought I was going to be a doctor and do that angle. But so, yeah, I think that was it. I just, I was always really balanced in doing other things while I'm playing. Having done, um, you know, quite a few of these interviews now, that's a pattern that I'm picking up on is diversifying one's identity and indulging in other pursuits, whether it's just a passion project or mm -hmm. a dual career, you know, going on two unparalleled paths. But it seems as though people who begin the kind of transition before they actually come to the point of mm -hmm. the big jump, mm -hmm. it seems to ease the transition. Still not easy for many, but it, it does seem to have some positive impact uh, on how that transition goes. It's harder, I think nowadays though, to find the time to do it. It's much more demanding nowadays, you know, with the professional athlete. And, but you still, you know, you're still in environments where you could, because you have so much downtime as professional athletes, right? Whether you're on the road or you're in a hotel or you're, you're waiting for a game somewhere where you could easily foster those other things. And that's what I constantly tell people is, you know, be tracking those interests and passions while you're playing and be doing them and find time to do it. And I would have, you know, killed for some of the internship opportunities out there today that we didn't have that companies now realize like, she, I'll take an athlete any day, a professional athlete, even if I could steal them for a couple hours a week, right. To give the company also that skill set. So they're a commodity that is really valued. And I don't think athletes realize that while they're playing and, and capitalize on that enough. Mm -hmm. So through your playing career, you inspired a generation of women to, to play and in doing so become leaders. And so in, in inspiring that generation of young women or girls uh, as a byproduct of your play on the field, how did you then want to make that really a more deliberate focus through your leadership academy. Um, because having that occur as a byproduct and then try and almost bottle that up and, and teach it mm -hmm. are two very different things. Mm -hmm. How did you approach starting your leadership academy? I had been doing just basic soccer camps forever and they were successful and great. And, and yet I was like, God, death by a thousand soccer camps, please shoot me now if I have to do this for the rest of my life. Right? <laughs> like we should not be just teaching a kid how to keep, kick a soccer ball. The value of sports, I always felt was all the other things you learn, right? And as we know, as athletes, like it creates this incredible foundation on who you are and your confidence and your habits and your discipline and your ability to deal with adversity and setbacks. And so I just realized there's not any other camp doing that. Like, why aren't we talking about that? And I was constantly frustrated by the focus on sports being wins and losses and level you played and scholarships you were offered. And I was like, wait, no, that's not really the value. The gift of sport is that the gift of sport is that you're in this incredible environment that teaches you about life. And we should do a camp that actually focuses on that more. And so a group of us, five of us, my husband and I, and a, a soccerette, see, it always goes back to your teams. Mm -hmm. uh, and her husband and a friend said, hey, what if we, you know, created something that dealt with it more overtly and was character development and confidence and all these things. And so we launched it, you know, soon after I retired as let's mix sports with and we didn't just say soccer because we do more than just soccer. And eventually I'd love to do every sport, right? But let's mix sports and leadership together in a really fun, not definitely not 
you know, a teacher standing at a whiteboard, here are the 10 virtues of leadership. It's very hands-on and active and silly and, you know, do an exercise and debrief it and do team building and all these things. And so we kicked that off in 06, basically, because I just felt like we're not talking about this enough and we should be talking to girls in particular. The other thing I noticed is they're very hesitant to raise their hand and get out of their comfort zone, even the most confident of young, young women. And why is that? Why do we want to check every box and pretend that we have to be perfect? Because girls, you know, are really hesitant, myself included, in that, ah, oh, no, 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 I, you know, I'm not ready to do that in television yet. I can't host because I don't have that skill set. Instead of like a guy, it all, you know, often is like, yeah, I'll do it. I don't know it yet, but I'll figure it out. I don't know anything about that. Yeah, no, but yeah, kidding. fine. <laughs> and I mean, which is a great skill set of men, which we women, you know, oh, no, 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 we got to go down at every box ticked, right? Right. We've got to be disciplined and prepared or I don't have the time. I mean, we make excuses too often instead of just being like, what the hell? Go. And so I wanted to give women that little nudge of you're going to be fine. Raise your damn hand <laughs> now. Yeah, it's fantastic. I love the approach that you're taking and you have so much to teach. And I'm wondering what have the participants, the young girls, what have they taught you over the course of the 12 yeah. years of your academy? What they've taught me is that if you can plant a seed of leadership is personal, not positional, which is what we always talk about, right? You don't have to be a president. You don't have to be a CEO. You don't have to come from a background of leadership training to lead. If you can plant that seed and show them, for example, we talk a lot about Mia's leadership style being very quiet and very personal, but super effective, but very different from Laudy Foudy. And yet you need all of that, I would argue. And our team was successful because we had all of those varying styles. If you just had a bunch of talkers, right? or just a bunch of thinkers that were cerebral and didn't want to talk, you have issues. So you need that balance. And so what I found is it's this, in literally a week, it's this transformational experience for them that they just needed someone to give them that information. And even though parents may be giving it and teachers are giving it, but when you shine the light on all these different examples to people they've you know, watched or heard of, and not just in a soccer forum, but um, it all, it becomes this really empowering experience and, and, co- and confidence just rises, of course, right? Is that, uh, oh, it's okay that I'm shy and quiet. I still can make a difference in life. Mm-hmm. You know, you've captured so many of those lessons in, in your book, Choose to Matter, which I really enjoyed. I know your stated audience was uh, middle school and high school girls into college, but as a 35-year-old man, I'm like listening to this on Audible and like furiously writing notes. Like, there's so many good lessons. Yeah, I get a lot of uh, adults saying that, so that's nice. It, it has, it kind of crosses over, so it's great. Because of the simplicity. And that's not to mean that it's not deep, right? Because right. to be simple is actually really difficult. Right. You know, Mark Twain, I think, said, I would have made it shorter if I had more time, right? right? So to be that concise and simple is like, I really mean that as a compliment because you've just, you've boiled down and packaged up so much of that in a really relatable way that I personally gained a lot from. So thank you for, for putting the book together. Yeah. And one thing that we have in common is that I am also hot pink with a splash of turquoise. Are you? I am. I no am. way. That's <laughs> yeah. your that's your personality traits, your yeah. leadership traits. That's funny. <laughs> With the book, talk about uh, the writing process for you. How did this book come to be and what, what motivated you to put it out? Because that, that's quite an undertaking. It uh, honestly stemmed from me reading my kids' books and being so frustrated by the themes of them. So when they were in, you know, in elementary school, the, the early stages of elementary school and the themes just constantly being negative or less than empowering for women in particular for Izzy, right? I actually went to Disney and I said, Disney owns ESPN. And I said, honestly, your books are driving me crazy, (laughs) right? For my daughter, because the mom's either dying or the prince is coming to save the princess. And I said, full transparency, I've thrown out every Disney book I have. And I said, why don't we do one? that is empowering for that next group, right? So beyond the princess stage into middle school, high school, but like you have to let me write it. It has to be in my voice. It's going to be all our leadership academy curriculum and exercises and interactive and 
and we're going to do things that we do at our leadership academy. I'm going to put it in a print form and it's going to be fun. And you can't make it like princessy and sparkly. Mm -hmm. They were like, all right, all right, we get it. We get it. Yes. And, you know, Disney fully realizes like, which is why you see, you know, Brave and all these other, uh, I'm blanking on the one with um, Ella. Frozen. Thank you, Frozen. Yeah. You know, I haven't seen that. I'm glad I got that yeah, right. Yeah, it was Frozen. You know, all these other, uh, you know, strong female uh, princesses that are coming forward and they realize they're changing that, that shifting that. And so it was a good time for me to come in and say, hey, this is what we need to do. And this is what I'd like to do. And they gave me the green, green light really quite easily, actually, mm -hmm. which you talked to other authors who were like, I had to pitch to 15 publishing houses. And, you know, how many did you go to? I was like, one. <laughs> and they said, yes. Yeah. But I honestly think, which is a good lesson, I think for other people as well, like it's important you go in and be fully honest about it. Like I, I don't, as a mom, I'm worried with the messaging of some of, you know, what you have out there. And, and I'm also an employee, right? So that's double hard, right? I'm not just a random person off the street. I'm going to, I work for you, but, and I love our company greatly. And I love Disney, but this is something we need to address. And they clearly understood it. And so we're phenomenal. It was one of the best experiences I had. Got to work with a great team of women at Disney. And, uh, and of course, it's an imprint of ESPNW, which I do a ton with of, at ESPN and just the women's side of, of what we do. And they were the ones who, when I had the dreams, I went to the two women who run ESPNW, Laura Gentili and Allison Overholt and said, hey, and I always write turbulence, you know, because usually it's on planes when I come up with these ideas. Turbulence. I have an idea. <laughs> I want to, you know, I, I've gone through all these old articles that I've written for, you know, ESPN Rise, which was a high school website we used to have on team building and leadership stuff. And I'm like, we could easily, you know, interview 10 women and wrap all those interviews around some of these articles. We could push out a book that would be so fun for teenagers. And I don't think it'd be that hard. I think that was like my exact words. And within five minutes, both of them were like, yes, yes, and yes, let's go to Disney. So, you know, and that helps too, to have a team around you that is a dream team, as I call it, that's going to be supporters. Yeah. At the core of the book, I really saw it as a vehicle to help teach people to write their own story. And so I'm curious if you could write your own story, you know, write your legacy, building on what you've accomplished today, how would you write your legacy? I, I mean, I think one of the things... I always think about and what I'm always so passionate about is empowering, which is why the leadership academies have become part of my life mission is empowering young girls to believe they can. Right. And having lived through it with the national team and being told so many times we were crazy and that's a silly dream. And why are you thinking that way? Why are you thinking so big to realizing, gosh, if it weren't for those amazing women around me who gave me the courage to dream and who gave me the courage to say, yeah, I'm not crazy, I'm courageous, I don't think we would have accomplished what we did. And so if I can be a source of inspiration, you know, via a book or a documentary or whatever my next chapter is going to be in life, it will be something that surrounds itself around that or even work I do with ESPN. You know, we try and do a ton of features on amazing women that maybe people haven't heard of or interesting stories. I mean, one of the favorites, my favorite stories I did was a, you know, basketball team of 80 to 85 year old women, the Splash Sisters. You know, hmm. It's been viewed 25 million times on Facebook. And they're just this amazing, rad women that are, you know, took up basketball in their 70s, some of them. And they're like, I never got a chance to play. So why not start now? So cool. 76, right? So like those kind of stories or that type of impact I can have to inspire, you know, a young woman or a girl to believe she can do anything she wants to do is really what is my passion in life for sure. Mm -hmm. So I've seen you've been asked what advice you'd give to your younger self, but I'm curious, what would your younger self, the little Julie that people often call Jimmy, <laughs> what would she say about you now? <laughs> She'd say, well, you need more than one donut a week, sister. <laughs> <laughs> and how come you're still concave in the chest area? <laughs> um, but really, I mean, you've <laughs> thinking about where you started as a young right. girl with a lack of female athlete role models with no national team 
into the number of, of medals that you won, which is actually probably second to, you know, the primary thing of the number of people that you've inspired. What would that young girl say about what you've done, including what you're doing now since making your big jump? Young girl was very conscious of enjoying the moment, which is, <laughs> which is uh, something I loved when I look back on, uh, and especially in the pressure moments of World Cups and everything. So I think she would remind me to keep enjoying the moment, right? And I think that's why, honestly, I've been able to diversify in ways I have is, you know, I, I don't think take, I don't take anything too seriously, which I think is a healthy trait, right? I'm very focused and I'm very driven, but at the end of the day, like I have an adorable family and great kids. And, and that's the other perspective. I think that's so important for people is that, you know, do not let work define you, right? Mm -hmm. Let it be a part of your life and a great, wonderful part of my, of my life, but I'm able to step away from it. And if I ever had to step away from television or anything that I'm doing, I mean, there'd be, an, I feel like there's another you know, 700 avenues I could go down. And what a great feeling that is to have that confidence of, I don't need this. This doesn't define me. And that will always be my anchor, as I call it, right? That, that I can find joy in so many different areas and I have the, the ability to do a lot of different areas. And so I think that younger, younger uh, Julie would, would say, you know, keep making sure you enjoy the moment. That's great. Well, thank you for that. It's great wisdom. And uh, you're such a gift in, in your leadership, wow. past, present, and I'm sure future will be a gift to many people. So thank and, you. And next time we do this, we're going to have just a plate full of donuts in front of us <laughs> instead of just two Danish. Plate full of donuts, coffee. No, actually, beer would be better. Donuts and beer, that's all I need in life. I'll take you up on it, Julie. It's a deal. <laughs> Thanks, David. Thanks for doing this. So important that you're doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Give The Big Jump a holler on Instagram or Twitter, at Big Jump Show. On the podcast chart, season one netted a perfect five-star rating for The Big Jump. And if you're so inclined, I would be grateful if you could show some love by throwing us five stars. And if this is your first episode, don't forget to subscribe. And show notes, get your show notes here. If you're listening while driving or are sharpening knives underwater, show notes for this episode and links to everything mentioned can be found at thebigjumpshow.com. When I need a change of pace from podcasts, I love listening to audiobooks on Audible. So I partnered up with Audible to give new customers a free audiobook. They're an Amazon company, so everything just works, and they've got over 180,000 titles to choose from. Just go to thebigjumpshow.com slash audiobook to get your free audiobook, simply for creating a free account. Again, to start off your Audible account with a free audiobook, go to thebigjumpshow.com slash audiobook. Happy listening. And lastly, I want to say thank you to our sponsor, Grand Voyage, a luxury fashion brand and a personal favorite of mine that makes shoes and bags designed in LA and handcrafted in Italy at the same factories as other premier fashion labels, but at a much better value. GQ says they're, quote, changing the fashion game. And Grand Voyage is perfect if you're trying to change up your fashion game. And by change up, I do mean upgrade. Use the promo code THEBIGJUMP for $35 off the beautiful bags and shoes from Grand Voyage. Yes, $35 off. Go check them out. See what I mean by going to thebigjumpshow.com slash shoes. And from there, as they say, the rest is up to you.